Although institutionalized party systems can often seem impervious to change, they remain vulnerable to shifts in circumstance that threaten their base of support. The recent international economic crisis brought to the fore fundamental changes that are occurring. Patterns of growth in the global economy, demographic shifts, the introduction of new technologies into politics, and other socio-political transformations are challenging political parties to adapt. So, um, as you know, the rules are uh, panelists are supposed to take around seven minutes to discuss their topic. And so we'll start with Christophe Grambe, and the first paper is uh, Europe, where the crisis mattered. Thanks, David. So, as David mentioned, I'm going to talk about Europe, the political parties in Europe, and how the political landscape has changed. I think I'm one of the few people at this conference who uh, will talk about Europe. So I guess um, that means that in the minds of the organizers, there isn't all that much disorder in Europe, or maybe it means that the disorder is not very new. I think I will, would tend to agree with uh, the latter point, uh, so that maybe the uh, disorder is not very new. That will be maybe one of my points uh, that I will make today. The first question I want to address is basically whether there is increased party instability in Europe as a result of the uh, last uh, years of the economic crisis. And I think if we sort of look at the different countries in Europe, that we can say that in some countries there has been more instability. Uh, if we look at what has happened in recent elections, there are some countries like Italy and uh, Greece where voters have turned in very large numbers to totally new parties or to parties that used to be sort of fringe parties that got a couple of percent of the vote and then suddenly in the past few elections, in the past few years, got uh, to be almost or the largest parties in the political system. Then we have some other countries like Spain, uh, Portugal, and even more so Ireland, where there have been significant moves of uh, voters from one established party to another, larger movements than there have ever been before. That definitely was the case in Ireland, and also happened in some, some other countries like Hungary or Iceland. Mm -hmm. Now, if you sort of look at the list of countries that I've gone through so far, these countries also happen to be the countries that were the most heavily affected by the economic crisis. So you could argue that there has been a lot of change in the party system in those countries that were really having the uh, most significant problems, uh, that had trouble staying in the Eurozone or uh, if they, in case they uh, were not in it to begin with, so their financial systems come close to collapse. Um, in the other countries, there has not been all that much change. If we look at the, some of the largest countries in uh, Northern Europe, Germany, France, uh, even the UK, there has not been all that much uh, of a movement recently, at least no movement that is significantly different from what happened before. If we look at these Northern countries, then you can definitely see that the main political parties, and in most countries this is a socialist party, and a conservative or Christian democratic party, that their, share, their shares of the votes have declined. But that's a movement that not only happened in the past couple of years, it's a movement that's been going on for decades. In these countries that I mentioned, Germany or the UK, if you look at the two largest parties, if you go back all the way to the 50s or even the early 70s, these, the largest two parties got 90% of the vote or even more, 95% sometimes. Recently, this is not the case. If you look at the UK, the two largest parties together uh, at the last election got about two-thirds of the vote only. And the same was true even more so in Germany, where the two largest parties together got less than 60% of the vote at the most recent uh, general election. But this movement, away from the traditional parties, has been going on for decades. Now, what are the reasons for that movement? I think there are many reasons for it. Um, the first one that I would mention is that voters in general have become a lot more demanding and uh, a lot better informed also, and uh, that as a result of that, they are more inclined to uh, move away from one party to another to punish parties that have been in power and have not performed very well. Mm -hmm. So that's 
I would say definitely uh, one a thing that's ha that has happened. Then there's also a specific reason why these two large parties have lost a lot of votes. If we look at the socialist parties, uh, where they tended to uh, get their uh, votes, the working class, well, it just happens that if you look at the uh, working class and the importance of industry in uh, Western European economies, that industry has become less important as a share of the economy, and as a result of that, their potential pool of voters for these socialist parties has shrunk. If you look at the Christian Democratic parties, a lot of people tended to vote for them automatically for religious reasons, but since religion has become almost insignificant in European politics, one of the main reasons for people to vote for these parties also disappeared. So the potential pool of voters for these two parties, or the loyal voters who would always vote for these two parties, has uh, gone down uh, dramatically. Now, what has been the response of these parties to that? Um, they, so far, have not re really been able to give a very good response. And I think the main issue that they have failed to address so far in Europe, which is maybe not necessarily different from what has happened in the United States, is that the two or the main parties have not really given an answer to the question, what should we do to make sure that the welfare state that we built in the post-war period will be able to survive in, a, in an environment with increased global economic competition. Most political parties throughout Europe have not really told voters, okay, this, we can also preserve this system. We'll have to introduce some dramatic reforms if we want to preserve the essential aspects of this system, if we want to prevent abuse of the system and so on. So most of these political parties have continued to make people believe that they can basically um, just continue and go on as uh, they have in the past few decades. But since they have failed to deliver on these promises, voters have turned to other parties. They've turned to fringe parties that didn't used to be all that important, protest parties like in Italy, or in countries where um, there have been large regional differences, also large perceived regional differences in the abuse of the welfare state, people have turned to nationalist parties. Now, what have the main parties done in reaction to this? Well, on the right especially, uh, the traditional parties have reacted by becoming a bit more nationalist themselves. On the left, it seems to me that uh, the main parties on the left so far have not really found a way to uh, deal with this problem, except maybe in the most northern countries, in Scandinavian countries, where they have tried to preserve the welfare state by uh, making some concessions on issues that they didn't seem to consider as very uh, essential to the preservation of the welfare state. They've made labor markets uh, more flexible. They've invested more in uh, subsidies to uh, companies to encourage uh, innovation and things like that. Mm -hmm. But more in the South, I believe that uh, socialist parties so far have not really uh, come up with a very good answer to uh, the question, how can we make uh, our welfare states uh, survive? And I think that is the fundamental problem that underlies the decline in support for the traditional uh, political parties in Europe. I think that's what I okay. wanted to say okay. as my initial remarks. Okay. Thank you very much. The second speaker uh, is Hari Han, who uh, for political scientists is uh, unusual because she actually has worked in campaigns. She worked in uh, Senator Bradley's campaign, which did not uh, become President Bradley. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. She, she changed, it wasn't her fault, she always said. Uh, she changed that in 2008 and 2012 uh, by working in President Obama's campaigns. And her topic today is changing campaign strategies. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I want to start just by thanking the Assam Institute for inviting me here today to be part of this conference, and it's a real honor to be on the panel with everyone else here. Um, I think that we were, talk we're talking about partisan disorder around the world, and each of us is taking a different area of the world, and I'm, I'm here to talk about the United States. And so I thought that I would start by talking about sort of two trends that are changing in U.S. politics right now. And so the first is that there's a you know, big demographic shift that's happening in the United States. Um, according to U.S. Census projections, by 2045, there's going to be no majority racial ethnic group in the United States, that whites will be um, less than 50% of the population. 
Hispanics um, are projected to be 18% of the population in 2015, and they think that it's almost going to double by 2060, so they'll be 31% of the population. Um, and Asians, just for, for reference, they're 5% of the population um, in 2015. They're projected to be 8% of the population by 2060. And so we have these really fast-growing minority groups in the United States that's changing um, the party base. And the second shift I want to talk about is technology. You know, we all know that technology has been changing politics um, all over the world. You know, just looking at the Arab Spring and things like that, you can see the ways in which technology is changing, the ways in which people participate in the political system. Another indicator of that is um, if you look at the 2008 election in the United States, which is often thought of as, a so as the social media election, because Barack Obama for the first time used social media in his campaign to great effect, there were um, 1.8 million tweets on election day in 2008. Now, in 2013, there's about 1.8 million tweets every six minutes, right? And so just in those four years, the number of people that are, that are tweeting around the world has really changed dramatically. And so the question that I want to take up today is, you know, well, so how are parties in the United States reacting to this? And I thought I'd start by looking at the U.S. election in 2012 as a way of beginning to get some traction on that question. And so I think one trend that we see in the... Um, in U.S. elections over, over, US, over the past decade or so, is there's an increased fo focus on mobilization. There's an increased focus on the ground game in campaigns. And so if you look at data from the American National Election Study, which is a study that's been run every election year since about the 1950s, from about the 1950s till 2000, about 25% of the population report having been contacted by a party um, in an election year. But beginning in 2004, you had about 30... 5% of the people reporting being contacted, and by 2008, the number's over 40%, right? So just in, in a few election cycles, we've gone from 25% to over 40% of people reporting being contacted by an election party. And so those, those numbers might not be perfect because people always report that it's based on people's self-report data, but I think the trend is clear that there's a lot more focus on the ground game than what we've seen before. And I think a lot of people, when they look at campaigns, Pundits and political scientists alike have tended to focus a lot on the money game, you know, looking at how, many, how much money campaigns have as a way of, of trying to understand what kind of resources they have to bring to bear to the campaign. But I think with the growth of ground operations, you know, part of what we want to begin to look at is the, the way in which they deploy their, their resources on the ground. Um, and the reason for that is in a close race, the ground game can really be decisive, right? And so the way the battleground states are, getting, are playing out in U.S. elections these days, you have a lot of states that are being decided by very close margins, and th there the ground game can be, can be the margin of victory. So in 2012, for example, um, you know, Obama for America had a much superior ground game to the Romney campaign. And so they collected, for example, 1.8 million voter registration forms, meaning they registered almost 2 million new voters. And in five states, the number of voter registration forms that they collected was the margin of victory um, in, the, in battleground states. Um, they also won the early votes in key states like um, Florida, Ohio, Nevada. You know, none of these things are decisive by any stretch of the imagination. There's so much else going on in a campaign. But I think these things begin, they, they make a difference in a way that we haven't paid attention to as much. And so if you look at what they did, they had 313 more field offices than Romney did. Um, on Facebook, Obama had over 20 million more likes than the Romney campaign did. He had over 18 million more followers on Twitter. Uh, his campaign had 18, over 18 million more followers on Twitter than, than Romney. And so they were just deploying you know, their field operation a lot more effectively. And so one of the things I wanted to think about today then is, well, so how did they do it? You know, what, did, what did they do that the Romney campaign um, didn't do? And so one way to, ass to assess a campaign's um, field operation is to look at voter contact. Voter contact is sort of the gold standard in, in what these, the ground operation is trying to do. What they're trying to do is, is basically call or meet or talk to as many voters as they can to try to persuade them and or get them to turn out to vote for their candidate on election day. And usually if you look at traditional campaigns, you know, the, if, you look, if you sort of see like how uh, voter contact increases over time, it's a pretty straight line, right? They start off pretty slow in the beginning of the summer, let's say. They build up slowly, and then before election day, the number of voter contacts they're making goes up dramatically. In the Obama campaign, if you look at their rate of voter contact, the line was almost flat throughout the entire summer. It was, they, had, they made very little vote, voter contact throughout the, end, throughout the summer. And then after the convention in early September, but then really in October, the month before the election, the line just skyrockets. So it looks like a hockey stick lying down, right? It's straight all the way, and then it skyrockets up um, the past. And so 
what they were doing is they were, they were, trans they were thinking about a new way of running um, field campaigns in, in, in US politics. So traditionally what field campaigns do is they, you know, campaigns will hire a bunch of young people to go out to battleground states and then spend months and many, many hours and many sleepless nights just contacting and talking to as many voters as they can, trying to get them to turn out to vote. What the Obama campaign did is during that time of the campaign when their levels of voter contact were almost flat, they were focused on, instead of um, hiring a bunch of young people to go out and run their field campaign, on investing in a, a lot of volunteers, right? So they were, they were recruiting and training and equipping um, a lot of people who lived in their local neighborhoods in order to be, have those people be the ones who made the voter contact. Because there's all sorts of research that shows the more personalized the, um, the contact is, the more effective it is. And so by training all these neighborhood teams, then at the, in the last month of the campaign, they were able to deploy all that power and make the same or more voter contacts in that last month than most campaigns make in the, the entire um, stretch of the, of the field operation. And so um, I think that, you know, given, given, the way that demographic, given the way demographics are changing in America and the fact that a lot of the minority voters that are beginning to become increasingly more of a majority in both parties, you know, these voters are going to have to be mobilized in new ways, right? Because they're not necessarily going to... Um, they're not necessarily the ones who are going to respond to the same kind of contacts that we've had in the past. And so the point that I want to make is I think one of the ways in which parties are reacting to some of the demographic technological changes that we're seeing is through sort of an increased focus on this mobilization pattern and a shift in the way that they're doing it. I think Obama for America in 2012 was a good example of that, but we're, going to be, we're beginning to see that in a lot more campaigns, both Democratic and Republican, on both sides um, you know, that are already preparing for the 2014 election cycle and I think will only ramp up even more in 2016. Um, so I will stop there. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker mm -hmm. is uh, Kim ji um, who is, as I uh, introduced her, at the, uh, does public opinion at Asan, and she's going to uh, talk on Korean politics. Um, <clears throat> thank you. And first of all, I'd like to um, thank uh, Professor Brady to be here in the panel with me. And this is two times in a row, <laughs> only the last year. And also, um, Professor Mofiarina, um, if you ever have um, taken the course in American Politics 101, then you guys are going to encounter those two names very, very frequently. Um, so the title of this session is Stability and the Change of the Post-Crisis Party System. As um, yesterday's keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Kressner, uh, aptly put, I think as domestic politics can be, cannot be the part away from um, the global crisis that we observe right now. But uh, when I was asked to talk something about the post-crisis uh, and the party system in Korea, there are two questions in my mind that I have to figure out. So first is, uh, what crisis are you talking about? And uh, secondly, the, has the party system of Korea ever stable so that I can say something about the change in the party system? Uh, regarding the first question, um, people from Europe and the, American, um, the United States maybe think about uh, when, when it comes to crisis, you can think about the uh, economic crisis in 2008. But in Korea, it is not the only one. We always have been in the regional security crisis since probably 2007. And also we together experienced um, the economic crisis, of course, um, since 2008. And most recently, we have a nuclear crisis. Um, initiated from the North. So basically, the Korea um, con um, continuously has been in the crisis mode almost every day. So please pick any one crisis for me so I can take the question and the answer to that. And the second question is that, um, so it raised a fundamental doubt that do we ever have a party system that we can call the stable? So I can talk about some changes after whatever crisis that is. Um, so the problem is the Korean party system has never been really stable since the democratization in the year of 1987. Um, the parts of Korea has experienced the frequent mergers and split and the change of the names. And uh, when I counted and calculated, the, the average life cycle of the Korean parties after uh, democratization was five years. So we continue to change the names or split and merge it in the uh, parties. Um, and if you ever witnessed the last year's presidential election, and then you probably also heard of the Antrasu phenomenon, um, that might be really weird to many eyes uh, from the European countries and the U.S. because this guy is independent, 
has never ever been in the politics, and the, all of a sudden came out of nowhere, and then, well, I'm running for the president. And then he actually was quite a strong candidate, and he maintained at least 30% of the support throughout the year, and before, uh, even before he dropped out of the race in uh, late in November. So, well, so you have to understand that how the Korean parties are distrusted by the electorates and vulnerable to any outside attack on the elections. But um, it's also hard to declare that then the Korean party is just very weak, unstable, and vulnerable, and um, um, uh, well, it is always in disarray because part, even though they have changed their names, but two party lines, major party lines and the lineage since the democ democratization in 1987, so the Senuri Party, current one, which is actually the, the collection of the people who were co-opters of the authoritarian regime, and the DUP has the origin and the root for the dissident of the democratization movement. And currently, I would say that 30 and 35 percent of electorates, they can identify with the Senuri Party, and 20 to 25 percent of electorates, they identify with the DUP. And around 10 or 15 percent of the rest, other parties, and the rest will be the independents who say, oh, I don't really support any of the parties. And it has been quite a solid, uh, the support rate was quite solid for throughout the two or three years since we started our own poll in the Asan Institute. Um, so once the, the two parties, so we started the democratization, was divided into two um, lines, as I just briefly mentioned. So first is authoritarian co-opters, second is democratization dissidents. And well, soon it was replaced by the national security issue, particularly how to deal with the North Korea, and I would say probably the year around the 2000, uh, when there was a, uh, a summit between the North Korea and the South Korea, and probably uh, most well known by the Sunshine Policy. So if you're pro-Sunshine Policy, then you probably identify with DUP line, and if you're against the Sunshine Policy, you know, or, or any economic, um, unconditional economic aid to North Korea, then you probably identified with the Senri party. And it has been quite strong, actually, and until very recently, that was the main factor to divide the parties and um, the electorates to the party, uh, party affiliation, and the parties had a very different stake and the position on that issue. Um, but uh, while well, we all witnessed the turbulence in North and South relations most recently, and there's a nuclear test, and well, the Kaesong complex so just uh, very recently, they shut down the Kaesong complex and then we draw all, our, um, all the workers from there. And it had some change and did, it remained in that way, some changes at still the party levels. Um, the Senri party, and the, um, the supporters of them and also party, they, it was a great chance for them to solidify their voting bloc and the base. So they also urged the independents and the moderates to well see, I mean, those in um, the humanitarian aid to North Korea and sunshine policy was totally futile. And it seems that, according to our poll, many of the Korean electors agree with that idea. Well, for the DUP party, they, this is the, the party that's in trouble, huge trouble, because so far they're rational to against um, the Imam Bak government, the hotline policy, and defend the sunshine policy was that well, you know, during the Sunshine Policy and progressive uh, president, we were actually, you know, at least living in a um, peaceful era and coexisted, even though it was not really a great relationship. But now it seems that and almost everyone, not everyone, 70 or 80 percent of Koreans agree that, well, no more economic aid without the, um, the North Korea's apology. So it seems that they are really having a hard time to persuade the voters to take side with them. And more seriously, the young generation, like those who are in their 20s, um, they more and more agree with the Senri parties, uh, rather um, assertive and um, uh, re uh, reciprocal approach to the North Korea. And that would be uh, very, particularly very uh, difficult for the DUP and opposition parties to recruit new voters in the future. But um, there's a change part, uh, the global economic crisis. Um, well, to parties, I personally think the parts of Korea has not been very much dramatically different in the economic policies until very recently. I mean, it was uh, late President Kim Dae-jung who you know, accepted all the requests from IMF 
and also the, as the, and urged Korean industry to do the restructuring. And another progressive president, No Mu-hyun, he was the one who initiated Koros FTA. I mean, what kind of progressive president can initiate the FTA, free trade agreement? Um, but it was under the Im Myung-bak government that Korean people started to see the, what, um, the inequality and the, what's the difference at party level, um, the fiscal policy. Um, I think um, Im Myung, President uh, Im Myung-bak, he actually performed pretty well. I think he overperformed to overcome the economic crisis in, um, after the 2008 the global economic crisis. Because in the, all the indices, national indices, indicates that, I mean, even though I do not particularly like him, but I have to accept that he did a pretty good job on that. But it uh, kind of it raised the um, new demand from the voters that, okay, we have done enough about the economic development and the growth, then what about you know, redistribution this time? Maybe we can uh, take more focus on the redistribution of wealth and social welfare. So you remember, probably remember that uh, those turbulent years like 2010 and 2011 and 12, um, social welfare, a free lunch program, and economic democratization, that a slogan that uh, appeared in the, the last year's presidential election. And according to the Asan annual poll, we, uh, we have been asking the same question repeatedly uh, since 2010. So which um, uh, aspect do you ha think uh, that we have to focus more on in economic policy? So first, economic growth or the redistribution of wealth. And two, year 2012 is the first year that we observed that more than majority of Korean think that we have to focus more and put more effort on the um, redistribution of the wealth. So even more surprising thing is that we gradually start to see that there's a partisan divide um, among the people, the electorates. Not the, it is not the party um, platform, but the people actually perceive that it's a different platform and I take side with my party and I um, take side with the economic uh, growth or the redistribution of the wealth. Um, of course, there are some, some blurry points, like, you know, when the, I remember 2012 at the presidential election, um, now the president Park Geun-hye, she mentioned the social welfare 2011, and also she mentioned the economic democratization. I perceive that she meant that the regulations on the big businesses, but whatever that means, I'm still not really clear. Uh, but it seems that Henry Party, uh, it, they admit that there's a huge inequality in the society, so maybe we have to remedy it, but in a rather growth, uh, gradual and uh, uh, slow pace. But the DUP and UPP, they are asking for the um, uh, reform in a more radical way. Uh, and then it appears that the voters uh, perceive that, what they mean and what they um, the, uh, relatively well. So in conclusion, the Korean party system is still the phase of burgeoning and developing the agenda. It has, been a long, it has long been the um, personalized mechanism for the party bosses for their own um, presidential ambition, I have to say. But now they just start to develop the agenda. It has been the national security and still remains there. But now we start to develop the economic um, um, differences in economic policies, redistribution or social welfare. Um, I'm not really sure, but maybe in 10 years, maybe we can observe another the issue dimension comes out, such as the social issues like abortion and gay marriage we see in the United States. I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Professor Kono. Well, thank you. Let me thank first uh, ASEAN Institute for inviting me to this conference. And i also like to thank David Brady for organizing this uh, panel. And I particularly thank um, the organizers to include Japan in this panel because Japan seems to be ignored these days and uh, um, nobody seems to care about Japan anymore. But, um, um, I would like to be very simple in my uh, presentation. Um, the, the, the panel's theme is crisis and stability of party system. But I think uh, listening to what have been said, uh, discussed yesterday, throughout uh, the discussions, uh, the hidden agenda seems to be um, how this partisan stability or instability is going to have an implications for stability in international system. So um, my talking points, which I pre prepared uh, a month ago, uh, is only about the former part. But I might, if I have uh, time, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the second, uh, this implication for international stability as well. Um, let me start with the observations about two critical elections that have, have happened uh, recently in Japan. 
One was the 2009 uh, election in which Democratic Party of Japan, DPJ, won landslide. And uh, we thought that they, uh, this was going to be the arrival of a, a true two-party system, stable two-party system, uh, finally, in Japan. And then uh, DPJ uh, was devastate, devastatingly lost the elections in 2012, LDP, and uh, LDP-led coalition uh, came back to power in two, uh, December, last December. Um, uh, and as you probably know, Abe uh, has got an uh, overwhelming majority in the lower house. Now he's preparing for the upper house elections in July. Now, so there seemed to be a volatility, uh, increased volatility between those two elections. Um, what happened in between those two elections are the March 11th, uh, 2011 uh, earthquake. And this was unquestionably the big uh, crisis for Japan's political economy in many senses. 20,000 people have died or even still missing. A uh, nuclear accident happened in Fukushima and the Tohoku economy was devastated um, and we had to put a lot of resources for the recovery and reconstruction. Uh, so this was an external shock to the Japan's uh, political system. Did earthquake have anything to do with the demise of the DPJ or the evolution party politics ever since? The answer is yes, but in only, so, in only indirectly, in, in my opinion. What we have witnessed after uh, 311 earthquake are three big trends. One is the de internal dissolution of DPJ, Democratic Party of Japan. Uh, there, there is, you, you have to say, post-crisis anti-incumbency uh, sentiment. Every, everything what government does is not enough for this kind of crisis management. So the, uh, the DPJ, which happened to be in power after the uh, earthquake, had to be uh, uh, subject, subject to a, um, a lot of criticism uh, by the people, not doing enough, not doing fast enough, and so on. So there was an anti-incumbency uh, sentiment in the first place. And also, um, the, most the L DPJ, because they won the landslide in the 2009 election, they had a, such a vul electorally vulnerable uh, first year, first timers in, in, in the party. And they felt really uh, vulnerable to, the, to this kind of anti-incumbency pressure. So they had to be very critical of the, of the uh, top executive uh, of the DPJ, and they started to have a sort of separate movement um, uh, within the party. So that led to a dissolution of DPJs in many senses. Um, the second uh, big trend is the rise of local parties. And at first, this, what local parties were not coordinated. First, the, the Ishihara, uh, who now retired from the uh, Metro, Tokyo Metropolitan Governor to become a, nas uh, a national diet member, uh, had his own uh, movement in Tokyo. And ha Hashimoto, who is now the uh, leader of the Restoration Party, uh, was a leader in an Osaka regional party. And these regional parties weren't coordinated. But uh, be these two parties got together afterwards and it became a, uh, th an established uh, lo um, uh, restoration party, which is a big event. The third uh, important trend is an increased distrust among the voters. Um, uh, they were fed up with the LDP before. They are now fed up with the DPJ. They don't know what to do with the, with the, with the anti-government sentiment. So um, uh, there is a widespread uh, sort of uh, distrust uh, towards the political system in general. So these three trends have contributed to the 2012 uh, uh, election in which LDP-led coalition won a landslide. Um, but um, LDP won, uh, but the uh, voter turnout uh, went 10% down from the previous election, which means that there is a widespread sort of um, anti-political um, uh, sentiment. Um, the, reason, one of the, other reason, uh, what the other important reason why LDP was able to win so many seats is because of the lack of coordination among the non-LDP uh, 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 camp. Uh, as I said, there's a new party called the Restoration Party, which is competing in many districts with um, uh, LDP and also DPJ candidates, and DPJ and, and the Restoration Party had, uh, um, had to split the vote. So uh, LDP kind of uh, um, uh, gained a lot of seats from those uh, 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 benefited from the lack of coordination between uh, those two opposition uh, camp. My predictions toward uh, next election, uh, probably LDP will win. And uh, a more longer term prediction will be that I think that there will be a um, pressure toward the party system of Japan to come back to us as some kind of two-party system. And uh, I don't want to go into details of the, what the, um, the Japan's party uh, electoral system is like, because I think just to explain that, it takes a, you know, five minutes. 
So I'm not going to go into details, but there is a, you know, it's a partly um, single member district competition system where under which the, the two candidate comp competitions is more likely to be dominating. Um, and that there's a sort of inherent, inherent pressure toward uh, convergence for the two uh, party systems, at least two candidate systems in, in, in each electoral district. Now the question is whether this will become a two-party system uh, at the national level is, is questionable. It seems that the Restoration Party is going to, like to, is going to stay, and so there, unless there is some kind of movement between the Restoration Party and DPJ to get their act together, I think the LDP's dominance might uh, prevail. But I think there will be uh, some kind of coordination in the long run, uh, so there will be another two-party system uh, sometime later on. Um, but this volatil increased volatility, the fundamental volatility of the Japanese party system is not related only to the electoral system of the lower house, which I was just be I've been talking about. The, I think that the fundamental problem of the Japanese party system or the instability of the Japanese party system lies in the fact that there is a so uh, low uh, party identification uh, among the Japanese voters. Uh, if I always said this in, 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 in my first year political science class. In the United States, there's a conversation, you can have a conversation say, are you Republican, are you Democrat? And, you know, Republican-ness or Democratic-ness is a part of the identity, partisan identity. You can't have that kind of conversation in Japan. And I think that part of the reason why this kind of party identification lacks in Japan is because of the uncoordinated institutions, un uncoordinated electoral system. El uh, House of Representatives have one system, uh, House, of Rep House of Councilors have one system, uh, governorship and mayorship has a presidential system, and the local assemblies have an, a totally another system. So every time you, you, you go to the vote, um, you, you see a different slate of candidates, slate of parties, a different kind of uh, coalition makings uh, going on. Um, so that's a fundamental problem. Now let me uh, touch a little bit on the question of nationalism. Uh, now that the Abe has won a landslide, and there are a lot of uh, worries in the y yesterday's panels, about how uh, right-wing or how conservative the Abe's uh, policy is going to look like. Uh, I think that the rhetoric of Abe does not reflect the nationalism on the part of the electorate. I have, I have done monthly surveys for the last 17 or 18 months on, uh, using the web. And, and uh, I have three points in date, three points, 2012, January, 2012, August, and 2013, February, uh, uh, and I can compare some of the, uh, the support level for the policies for national security and, and the defense among the voters. And there have been uh, sy systemic increase in the support for policies, for example, for US Japan, strengthening of US-Japan alliance, strengthening of uh, de uh, self-defense forces, strengthening of cybersecurity measures, and so forth. So, and, and, and the, one of those months, uh, 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 August 2012, was the month in which Japan uh, uh, faced another external crisis of uh, Imeon Bak, uh, President Imeon Bak uh, landing on the Dokdo uh, Island, and also uh, uh, Chinese uh, Hong Kong activists landed in the Senkaku Island also. So, so there have been a sort of uh, a heightened sense of national security among the, uh, among the Japanese voters, and at these three points uh, trends if you look at the trends among those three points, you can see the general increase of the national security cons consciousness among the Japanese voters. But if you ask the questions about the possession of nuclear weapons, um, introduction of, um, um, what is it, uh, hmm. the, uh, the citizens, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, conscription, uh, or the um, uh, constitutional revisions, to make the self-defense forces into regular military, the, the support level is very low, and it went up in the month of August in which these crises happened, but when we're back to the normal level. So uh, the, um, at the elite level, there seems to be a, um, uh, a movement toward the right and conservative, but that is hardly reflected, uh, reflecting the overall sentiment uh, overall uh, preference of the Japanese voters. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, before we turn to the questions, and I'm told that uh, you can actually get these on Twitter. I don't know that I'm capable of doing that, but um, uh, we'll take questions. But this panel has uh, sort of a, a reasonably long history, uh, various parts of it. It began in Taiwan when we uh, tried to look uh, at a question of polarization and what caused polarization of the political parties. Um, 
And that, one of the things that came out of that was, well, the economic, the economic crisis, the fact of globalization without the crisis, but add, add the crisis to globalization, was causing something of this party uh, split. And, and essentially, many countries were facing the problem that Christoph mentioned. Uh, you have unfunded liabilities. Is it possible to, it's not possible to keep all the promises that have been made to all the citizens. So we then uh, had a long uh, conference in Rome on this question. And the idea, of course, is that what should be happening is, as they're not fixing the problem, as it becomes clearer and clearer that the welfare state as we know it can't be sustained, the question is something ought to be happening in political parties. Um, Unfortunately, at uh, that conference and the one at Stanford, it became clear that um, political parties are, as Masura said, uh, they differ dramatically across countries. So in the United States, and the trouble with thinking about party identification is that because uh, party identification was first started in the United States in the 50s, everybody else followed that model. But it turns out that in multi-party systems, people don't have that same party identification. I, I happen to believe that in the United States, people don't have that same party identification. The most impressive thing over the last 30 years in the United States is the rise of independence. Now, in our profession, there's some dispute about whether those independents are closet partisans or not. But, uh, the, the, but the question of the rise of independence may mean uh, that that's one of the things that's happening with voters. So I, I think that across this thing, there's two fundamental questions that uh, uh, have yet to be answered, and it's an ongoing project. The first is, uh, voters in most countries are centrist, it seems to me, in the sense that what they want is they want the government to solve the problem. And the second thing is governments are not solving the problem. And normally in democratic countries, the way that problem gets resolved is, say, the Christian Democrats who were always in the coalition in Italy during the period of the first and second great uh, economic revivals, uh, as in the United States during the New Deal, uh, as in Japan in 1955 when the LDP solved. So we have not had, uh, I don't think there's a single country represented up here or in any of the OECD or G20 countries that has resolved this problem about long-term futures. And I continue to believe that the study of political parties and elections uh, is crucial to understanding how and when that will be resolved. So with that uh, sort of general statement, uh, we'll take questions from the audience. And my uh, thing here says that it's trying to connect with Twitter, but it's not. So... (laughs) We'll take questions uh, from the audience. Or I could read the question from the Twitter, which is nothing. (laughs) Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait for the microphone. Are you supposed to identify yourself, too? Well, you may as well. (laughs) well. Hi, my name is Young Min. I'm a former intern at the Asan uh, Institute. Um, I guess my first instinct uh, coming in and listening to this panel is what are the similarities and the differences? Uh, and because we have experts from all the different countries, uh, I think this panel offers that special opportunity to uh, take that comparative perspective. And I feel like a res- resonating theme that I've seen is something that you spoke of, I guess, polarization, but also this sense of disaffection uh, with the main parties, uh, main political parties, obviously. In Europe, as you mentioned, you have the shift away from the, uh, the Christian um, social democrats. In the U.S., you, have, you saw the rise of the Tea Party in Obama's first term. Um, and we touched upon how in Korea we had the An uh, phenomenon and so on and so forth. But I guess I think it'd be interesting to ask or, or probe the reasons as to why that is in each country. And although the we see the similar theme, it may be so that the reasons are different. Um, for example, is it economic or is it more so an ideological phenomenon? I don't think we would characterize the rise of the Tea Party um, or equate the causes of that with, say, the on uh, phenomena, which was more about economy, redistribution. Um, 
So I think, I guess that would be my question, what, what the, the reasons are in the respective countries um, that cause these, this kind of unified... Okay, uh, so there's two, two ways we can do this. Uh, you can volunteer or I'll call on somebody. <laughs> I can say something. All right, okay, you start. <laughs> Save the rest of you. Um, well, so speaking about the United States, I mean, I think this gets back to a point that Professor Brady made earlier, which is that, you know, I think it's right that voters fundamentally want government to solve problems, and part of what's going on is that government's not solving, like our governmental institutions aren't equipped to solve a lot of the problems that we are facing right now in our politics, and I think that's true across the world in, in a lot of instances. And so um, what we're seeing is that, you know, we're in a situation where, you know, if we, look, if we look over the past several decades then, you know, the economy is transitioning into an information economy, so there's economic uncertainty that's going on, there are big demographic shifts that are going on, there's economic crisis, and there's a lot of international instability you know, as sort of the, the, the world powers begin, begin to shift. And all that creates a lot of uncertainty, and at least in the U.S., our political parties, I think neither of them have really been able to um, mobilize in institutional power in such a way that they can address some of the problems and the uncertainty that's arising out of all these all these different factors. And so that's where you have a lot of the uh, disaffection that you're talking about coming out of. You know, that, so the Tea Party on, on, from the conservative side and Occupy Wall Street from, on the liberal side and you know, a lot of other, these other things are just symptoms of the fact that government isn't, is, seems gridlocked all the time. It doesn't seem able to address the issues that need to be addressed. Yeah. Um, uh, well, if I may comment on the Korean case. Well, if you look at the turnout, you can totally see that how disaffectionated the, uh, the voters are from the political parties. The turnout in the 1987, 1988 was over like 80%. But now, well, this last year's presidential election was a kind of particular one, but before that, the presidential election in 2007, it was 68, 63% of turnout, which is, uh, I think, a uh, record lowest. Um, and then the political efficacy, when you um, do the survey, the people, so how do you think the politicians do hear your voice and you think your vote matters and do you think you can change the politics? And we observe really, really low percentage of people think it's so. And, but all the things, um, I would say that this is transitional era of Korean political system and that we have been dominated by those political bosses and, and also they, they the, the basically the parties were working as a driving force to put them in the blue house. And then now we are kind of forming the real poly, uh, poly, political party system. I mean, I'm not saying that we are going to be resembling the European party system or U.S. party system, but, but uh, we are going into some new, a, a new phase. And the, the blame can be uh, light on the lack of op uh, opposition parties' uh, ability to provide an alternative to the voters, particularly the young generation. So they do not really, they cannot really agree with the agendas and platforms of Henry parties in many respects, uh, but they cannot really find um, any alternative from the opposition parties because they are totally in disarray, having lost the Kim Dae-jung and the No Mu Hyun, and then without the strong leader and the, the structure of the party, they cannot really give any options for the young voters particularly. And then they feel alienated from the party system, and then that uh, connected with the um, lowering the party identification the, um, percentage and also do not really see any solution and then that's probably why they're so enthusiastic um, of the, the Ancho Su and this, they believe to see that oh maybe this is a guy who can bring us the reformed political party system. So well it's not particularly the disaffection but I would say that well this is transitional phase so well maybe in the five years and ten years when the, the opposition party side, they are recuperated and recovered, then probably we can change the party system and see the different one. Thank you. Mr. Connell? Um, I may differ a little bit from the two um, comment, the, my, two of my colleagues who spoke earlier, which is to say that um, we tend to be very myopic about these kind of things. And I think that uh, the movements like Tea Party, I, I wouldn't say exactly the kind of same kind of movement, but I think there has been always uh, movements like that within, within each country. And um, uh, I think the parties and party system in general seems to sort of adapt and sort of, you know, carry on with this kind of um, uh, political apathy or uh, sort of in the sense of alienation. So um, um, uh, I, I don't particularly think that the, the recent phenomena is particularly 
you know, um, noteworthy in the sense that, you know, there's uh, uh, radical movements in breaking away from the traditional party system or anything like that, in the, in, at least in the advanced industrial democracies. Okay. Christoph, do you... Um, you only have 27 countries to cover, so... Okay. <laughs> and I will... Pick I will, a couple. Just I will pick throw a in the U.S. also. Okay. Make it 28. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say that if I... I mean, I don't know much about Korea or Japan, but if I look at European and American politics, my impression sometimes is that um, the crisis of the welfare state, as we know it in Europe and to some extent in the U.S., is maybe not big enough, and that as long as people can continue to believe that they, they can carry on um, paying uh, relatively low taxes in one uh, country at least, or uh, having very generous benefits uh, in the 27 others, um, given uh, how the tax rates in the latter case and um, the spending in the first case, uh, if, as long as people sort of continue to believe that it's possible to maintain that system, and there are some parties, um, whether they're established parties or new movements like the Tea Party that offer easy solutions um, to the problems, they will uh, continue to believe uh, that easy solutions are possible. Um, and in a way, I think the crisis needs to become bigger for, um, for politicians to be willing to really tackle the uh, problems. And as long as they don't really do that, dissatisfaction or disaffection with the voters will continue, I would think. I want to just add one little thing to that. Uh, Professor Piran and I did a piece on the 2010 election, and, which was a big switch to the Republicans in the U.S. Congress. And at the end of that, we had a table saying when you asked Americans what they should cut and what they should uh, continue to spend more on, our friend Roberto Dallamonte at the University of Italy looked at the table. Well, he said, you're just like us Italians. You don't want any taxes, and you want to spend more on everything that benefits us. And I think uh, what Christoph and the others have said, I, I think that's sort of essentially correct. The public opinion polls show people don't want to be cut on stuff that affects them. They want more spending on that. And in the United States, my favorite is they always want to cut foreign aid. And you point out to them that it's less than one quarter of 1% of the budget, and it doesn't, won't help any. You go back and ask the same people three months later, and they still want to cut foreign aid. <laughs> So other questions, yes, over here, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tokin Woon from Malaysia. Uh, I have a, a question for our friend from Japan. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's accurate to say that uh, or describe uh, Japan as a one-party state. I mean, except for, I think, a couple of years in the, in the 80s when the Japan Socialist Party came to power, and uh, the, the last uh, five years before the recent elections, when the Democratic Party came to power, <coughs> I mean, the LDP ruled Japan almost in an uninterrupted fashion for close to half a century. Now, uh, what is the cause for this? Uh, is it due to money politics? I ask because uh, it would seem to me that uh, you need a lot of money to be elected to, to the Diet, and uh, there have been stories of uh, Japanese politicians uh, uh, taking money to finance uh, party activities and so, and so forth. And that leaves, therefore, little space for parties that represent, say, the poorer strata of Japanese society to have any impact or any real chance at capturing power. And added to that, of course, is the role of the bureaucracy. How f true it is that... Uh, uh, ideologically, uh, the bureaucracy, although, although supposedly to be an, a neutral institution, uh, supports the uh, uh, LDP to a large extent, at least, uh, you know, uh, quietly. Uh, thank you. Masaru, I don't think there's anyone else on the panel that can <laughs> bail you out on this one. Okay. Um, cause of one party's dominance in, in Japanese party is politics. Um, if you find that answer, you can write a PhD thesis at any <laughs> university, uh, top university. And there, I'm sure there are lots of uh, a complex uh, uh, combinations of forces that are uh, uh, going into the creating one. But I, I, I guess I have a different um, view about when you say one party s uh, state, that it seems to imply there is a lack of competition. Uh, between parties or between candidates, and that is not the case. Uh, the parties have been always competing with each other 
even under the one-party rule from 1955 to 1993, and then there was a, a government change in 1993, even though it lasted for a year, LDP came back to power, but only so with the coalition partner. Uh, the upper house has been dominated by the opposition camp, and um, a two-party system have emerged in the last 10, 10 years or so, af, um, and the DPJ have, the Democratic Party of Japan have emerged as an alternative uh, party. Uh, it just happened to be uh, that this party wasn't successful in the, in, in the last election. Um, so it's not like a totalitarian state where the one party dominates in terms of uh, ideologies and uh, uh, the method of communications and so forth. It's, it, there has been always competition, and that's my view. And the, the patterns of competition, I think, have been uh, shaped by, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, many respects, by the existing institutional arrangements, including the electoral system. That is my view. Well, what, just a little follow-up on that. Just as uh, in the American South, the Democratic Party was dominant, in India, the Congress Party was dominant for a long time period, in part because they, they let anybody in. And so the changing factions, like when Tanaka comes in in Japan, mm -hmm. that surely has to be... Well, the LDP of 1960 isn't the LDP of uh, 1980 yeah. because of factions. Isn't that, yeah. That's also correct? Yes, that's correct. But you can only have that kind of explanation in retrospect. So yes, you yes, that's <laughs> Well, I'm very good at post-diction. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, other questions? Yeah, over here, sorry. Hi. Hello. Um, Okay, can you hear me? No. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask. Uh, yeah. um, so there seems to be a debate about, on the one hand, changes in the nature or the character of the party system. On the other hand, there's another issue about systemic changes in the party system as a whole. Um, and there was some discussion about whether or not, and I think the debate is, the way I understand it, whether crises systemically on the party system itself. What I wanted to ask was, is, uh, is that ever even possible? Uh, and you have systemic changes in the party system through some sort of big shifts that might occur um, in a voting population, for instance. One issue that is, is quite controversial, or everybody's talking about in the US, is the demographic shift that's close, that's slowly happening um, and is, is, a, is a train wreck that's likely to happen in the near future for the Republican Party. So, um, and, and if you look, at, and you mentioned a bit on globalization um, uh, towards the end of the, um, the panel um, discussion, we have in Korea, for instance, a, uh, a National Assembly member that, that was born in Korea uh, for the first time. So, I wanted to ask whether, whether demographic shifts could uh, have potentially um, uh, a, a huge impact on, on, on the party system itself. That is, could it have, a, not just on the character and the, and the nature of the party system, but the real systemic change? Yeah. Anybody? Hari, anybody? Sure. Um, well, so I'm not, I'm not totally sure what you mean by systemic shifts versus just a change in um, ideology or character of the party, but I think... I mean, I think definitely, like, history shows us that parties are strategic, right? And so what parties are trying to do is they want to mobilize as big a base of the population as they can in order to win, to win elections and maintain control. And so, for example, you know, around the New Deal where we, where we saw, you know, big economic crisis and this is in the United States, big economic crisis, and then um, the parties kind of having to make this decision about whether or not they wanted to sort of accept the broad outlines of the New Deal, then you saw... The Republicans tried to resist it for several elections, and then they eventually gave in once it became clear that the population wasn't there. And so then, you know, the parties kind of, ch the Democratic and Republican parties sort of changed a little bit what the meaning of that party was. And so I think it's, it's possible that that could happen with the demographic changes that are going on right now. You know, as, as um, some have mentioned, certainly the Republicans are facing this crisis right now of being able to reach out to minority voters um, in the United States. And so one big question is how they're going to shift their policy, if at all, around issues like immigration or other issues that might be relevant to some of those populations. And so I think it's unclear right now if 
how long that's going to take, but I think how long it's going to take for the Republican Party to shift. But I think it's very clear that eventually, within the next generation, as this generation of voters ages and becomes a bigger part of the voting population, that they're going to have to change. And so, whether or not that's a systemic shift or not, I think it depends exactly on how you define systemic. Um, the, I think the question as to whether the party system can withstand the democratic uh, the pressures or the democratic demographic shifts that is occurring in, uh, I think that. Uh, varies ac across different countries. For example, in Japan's case, there's no problem, with, uh, except for very, in, in a minor case, uh, the, uh, the uh, ethnicity problems. Uh, it, the democratic, demographic shift in Japan is age problem. And, and that seemed to be a to totally different problem than the one that, that she was describing about the U.S. cases. Uh, I don't know about South Korea, but... Um, um, uh, maybe at some point Japan would uh, open up for more op you know, Im Im immigrants and uh, it, that might create an um, uh, ethnic uh, demographic shift. That would have a huge impact, but I don't think that's going to happen in, in, in the near future. Uh, I guess I, I have sort of an answer. So, if, so we have, uh, in a project with colleagues at Stanford, we've uh, collected about 1,000 Gallup polls back to 1937, and then looked at change over time across the regions. And there has been, over that time frame, quite a change in regional uh, party strength. So the South and the Southwest are Republican, the Northeast and uh, New England have become very Democratic, so on. And in, a, in addition to that, there seems to be a rise in this uncertainty about Democrats have a, about a four-point lead, and then independents are... It's about a third, a third, a third, just roughly speaking. Uh, and if you mean, does that, so over time, does that change? Uh, well, if you mean by systemic change, voters change their minds. Surely a part of that is true, right? Because Amer American voters prior to the 1930s uh, would have thought no government aid. So the question prior to the New Deal was, how, uh, was uh, government aid or no government aid? And then after the New Deal, the party sorted on the basis of how much government aid. And, and again, uh, it, it does seem to me that in the U.S. and France and Europe in the 1890s, as, uh, which is also a period of very intense globalization, the same sets of issues uh, come up. Bankruptcy, immigration, currency floats, exchanges, how much trade, uh, uh, protectionism. Uh, that same set of issues come up, and, in, in the, and, and countries reacted differently. In the United States, it decided to go with a global system. In France, they decided not to, and therefore uh, their industry was hurt for a long time. seems to me that that same set of issues is present before us, complicated now by the fact that it's much bigger in that it now includes Asia and most of the world's population, India, that it didn't before. So I'm not surprised that uh, governments have not been able to uh, make this change and that citizens have not made a switch as they did uh, prior to the New Deal. But I think without such <coughs> systemic changes, at least in terms of public opinion, uh, then, then I think that uh, we're in uh, for a rather long period of uh, instability till we get these problems solved. Well, if I may yeah. talk about the Korean Kim, case. Dr. Um, Kim? So uh, about the demographic shift. Um, well, the Korean case is a very similar case to the Japanese one. Uh, we don't really have much of um, appearance of problems with ethnicity and, and also um, immigrants, while the, the percentage of immigrants and the multicultural family of Korean population is less than 2%. So we, it is kind of too premature to worry about it and how it will affect the party system. But as in Japan, we see the huge age gaps. And this, well, I was doing the survey and studying the presidential election in 2012, and actually I was uh, working on the gender gap, if there is any, in the Korean voters. Uh, overall, I didn't find any, but it was a huge gender gap among the, those who were in their 20s. And the 20s, young female voters are more, very much more progressive. And they really, really hate it for whatever reason, the, um, President Park Geun-hye. Uh, and the, the males and the uh, male voters in their 20s, um, they are very much conservative. I, I guess probably that's why national security issue, because they are the people who actually have to serve the military service in a mandatory way. And they feel the, the physical threat by the North Korea's provocation. Um, so, 
well, this is overall, if you look at the surface, you see the huge age gaps from the 820s and the 60s. But if you look at it within the age cohort, you see also the gaps between the, um, the, the female and the male voters. So the multicultural society, well, it's a long way to go, but we probably encounter huge age gaps and problems and maybe the gender gap in the foreseeable future. Okay. Uh, other questions? Questions? And I don't if have I may Twitter. comment oh. a little bit about the nationalism that was um, discussed by <laughs> Professor Kono, we did a similar survey last year, just right before the election, the Japan's election. And then we, uh, we were actually expecting that um, the, the crit huge criticism on the visit of Dr. by President Lee Myung Park and the sex slave issues, um, it was just probably the political rhetoric, and maybe Japanese electors do not really care much about it and then have different ideas on that. Uh, what we found was we didn't release it because we didn't want to spoil your election, but uh, the fact is um, almost 90% of Japanese people actually thought it was um, inappropriate for President Young Bak to visit Tokto. And, and also um, they thought it was enough of apology has, done, has been done by the Japan uh, on the sex slave issues and on the, um, you know, the imperial Japan in the 1940s. Uh, but what so it was slightly disagree <laughs> with your result, I would say. I, mean, yeah. I don't know, maybe it has changed in, in one year. Uh, but what, one thing that we found was that still, that more than 60% of Japanese uh, voters, they thought, well, even though they agreed that, well, it was an inappropriate and Tokto or Takeshima is their own property, and well, we've done enough about this uh, apology, but please do not do anything you know, to provoke, provoke the South Korea or China, and they didn't want it uh, to see. So that was from the, any government that was coming in at that time. So that was what the finding that we found. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I may have spoken a little too, too overgeneralized uh, some of my results, but uh, as you said, actually, uh, in, in the months right after the uh, President Lee myung visit to um, um, uh, Dokdo Takeshima Island, the, um, I also did a survey, even through the. Oh, sorry, but this is just for the web. But uh, so it doesn't re doesn't have representation representativeness of the, the entire populations. But I was very amazed how hawkish the younger generations of the Japanese were. Uh, in fact, it was really clear that uh, the younger generation, uh, some um, 30 to 40 percent of the younger generations, were even advocating using the military forces to take back the Takeshima. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, um, I think that, and also, uh, unfortunately uh, for, for the audience, um, the uh, feeling thermometer towards South Korea and the feeling thermometer toward uh, China have went down really low uh, after those incidents. And I don't think they'll come back in the long run, uh, uh, in the short run. I think they, the, the feeling thermometers are usually stable uh, and... Um, um, but this drop is very significant. I don't think they'll come. But in terms of the policy measures, I think that they are really sort of the, the, the electorates uh, reflect a sort of sense of realism in, in the sense that some of the measures that, that, that uh, if they want uh, uh, were presented as a choice of whether to adapt or not adapt, I think that you know, they come to the conclusion, oh, this is not going to happen. This is, this is too... Uh. So, yes, there is a sense of sort of um, instance sort of uh, a very um, uh, traumatic reaction to the, to the incidents. But on the other hand, I think at the deep down in the, in the electors, uh, th there is a, a sort of calm and, and a sense of realism still prevailing in the Japanese. I hope that is the case. Okay. I, I would be remiss in my duties, uh, because that's a very good question on demographics and change, if I didn't ask uh, Christoph to, in the last three minutes, summarize demographic change across all of Europe. But <laughs> I, I presume by doing this, you're going to talk about the low birth rate and uh, replacements. Yeah, I would just like to make one comment in that context. I mean, everybody knows there's lots of uh, a large immigrant population in uh, a lot of European countries and that uh, the birth rate in general is quite low. And that as a result of that, a combination of these two effects, that uh, the proportion of um, the immigrant population is uh, increasing. Um, which is especially true in some of the larger uh, urban areas. Now, I think one element uh, that has gotten less attention in the media as well as in academics, I think, is that 
um, in several European countries, they've made it a lot easier to uh, become naturalized uh, citizens, uh, to uh, obtain citizenship, and sometimes also to obtain the right to vote without obtaining citizenship, as for example in the, the country where I grew up, in Belgium. And the result of that has been that, um, at least in larger cities in, in uh, my own native land, in uh, Brussels and Antwerp, that the left has become a lot stronger. And in my opinion, uh, the parties on the left have deliberately extended uh, citizenship rights and voting rights to um, immigrant populations to counterbalance the rise of nationalism and the, ri the rise of, um, of uh, parties on the right. So I think that is... Um, definitely, given the demographic evolution, a factor that in the long run will uh, work to the advantage of uh, social democratic parties. Okay, I guess we have time for one last question, or I could give a really long concluding remark. No, I'm kidding. Um, last question? Okay, if we have no question on, I, I would like to thank uh, the uh, Asan Institute for uh, for a second year in a row uh, having uh, me and letting us put together uh, a panel uh, of this nature. I especially like to thank the panelists uh, for covering a wide variety of topics, doing so and succinctly. It's the first panel I've chaired in 20 years where I didn't have to pass something out saying, okay, your time is up. <laughs> so I think we owe the panelists uh, uh, gratitude. Thank you.